I'm going live, Paige. Paige. Lord Jesus, you fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Give to us discipline in our studies. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are critiquing, following uh, Prof. Erickson's critique of natural theology, it's talking about assumptions. We pick it up there in 161. There's also the criticism of the procedure of extending the argument from the observable to that which goes beyond experience. In the case of the watch found in the sand, we have something which can be verified by sense experience. We can actually check with the company whose name appears on the watch and inquire as to whether they manufactured it. We might verify that they did and perhaps even ascertain, ascertain the date of manufacture and the identities of those who worked on it. Furthermore, we recognize that the watch is similar to other watches which have been worn before, offered for sale, and perhaps even manufactured. Thus, we can extrapolate from past experience. In the case of the world, however, we do not have something which can be so easily verified by sense experience. How many worlds have we observed being created? The assumption is that the universe is a member of a class of objects to which we can compare it. <clears throat> this, however, must be established, not assumed. The argument from the analogy of the watch is to succeed. A further problem was alluded to earlier. Suppose one succeeds in proving by a valid argument that the world must have had a cause. One cannot, however, conclude from this that such a cause must be infinite. One can affirm that there was a cause sufficient to account for the effect. That one can lift 100 pound weight does not warrant the conclusion that he can lift any more than that. Because of the ease with which he lifted it, he might be speculated that he could certainly have lifted much more but this has not been demonstrated. Similarly, one cannot prove the existence of an infinite creator from the existence of a finite universe. All that can be proved is a creator sufficiently powerful and wise to bring this into universe into being, which great though it is, is nonetheless finite. In creating the universe, God may have done absolutely all he could, utterly exhausting himself in the process. In other words, what has been established is the existence of a very great but possibly limited God, not the infinite God that Christianity presents. A further argument is needed to prove that this is the God of Christianity, and indeed that gods which constitute the conclusions of Thomas's several arguments are all in the same being. Since the time of David Hume in his Inquiry of Human Understanding, section 11, the whole concept of cause has had a somewhat uncertain status. Cause, in some people's thinks, suggests an absolute connection. Hume pointed out the flaw in this idea of necessary connection. The most we have is a constant conjunction. Blah, blah, blah. David Hume. Book one. The teleological argument has come in for special criticism. Since Charles Darwin, the usual appeal to the intricacy and beauty of the organic realm has not carried much weight persuasiveness for those who accept the theory of organic evolution. They believe changes and characteristics have arisen through chance variations called mutations. Some of these were advantageous and some were disadvantageous. In the struggle for survival occasioned by the fecundity of nature, 
any characteristic which enables a species to survive will be transmitted. And those branches of the species which lack this characteristic will tend to die out. Thus, the process of natural selection has produced the remarkable qualities which the teleological claim, argument claims to point to a designer. To be sure, this criticism of the teleological argument has its shortcoming. Natural selection cannot explain away the inorganic adaptation observed in the universe. But the point is simply that those persons who accept evolution disagree with Thomas's assertion that there is compelling and necessary character to the conclusion of the teleological arguments. The teleological argument also encounters the problem of what might be termed dysteleological. If the argument is to be truly empirical, it must, of course, take into account the whole sweep of data. Now, the argument proceeds on the basis of seeming indications of a wise and benevolent God controlling the creation. But there are some disturbing features of the world as well, aspects of nature that do not seem very good. Natural catastrophes such as <coughs> hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and a host of other acts of God, as insurance companies term them, cause us to wonder what sort of designer planned the universe. Heart disease, cancer, cystic fibrosis, multiple sclerosis, and other destructive maladies wreak, wreak havoc upon humankind. In addition, man inflicts destructiveness, cruelty, injustice, and pain upon his fellows. If God is all-powerful and completely good, how can these things be? That is possible by emphasizing these features of the universe to construct an argument for either the non-existence of God or the existence of a non-good God. Perhaps the teleological argument would turn out to be an argument not for the existence of God, but for the devil. When these considerations are taken into account, the teleological argument appears less than impressive. And when we take Millard Erickson's arguments cumulatively into effect, less than impressive. <sighs> Not, there's no exegesis in his volume. There's no confessional commitments uh, that are evident. Uh, it's very experiential. Denial of general revelation. In addition to these objections, there are theological objections as well. Karl Barth, for example, rejected both natural theology and general revelation. Bart was educated in the standard liberalism, descending from Albert Ritchel and Adolf von Harnack, and was particularly instructed by Wilhelm Hermann. Liberalism did not take the Bible very seriously, resting many of its assertions upon a type of natural theology. Bart had good reason on an experiential basis to be concerned about the belief in general revelation and the liberals attempt to develop a natural theology from it. He'd seen the effect too closely, identifying developments in history with God's working. In 1914, he was shocked when a group of 94 German intellectuals endorsed Kaiser Wilhelm's war policy. The names of several of Bart's theological professors appeared on this list. They felt that God would accomplish his will through the war policy. Their view of revelation had made them extremely undiscriminating 
regarding historical events. Together with this shift of Ernst Kroltz, Kroltz from the Faculty of Theology into that of theology, this disillusioning experience indicated the, the shallowness and the bankruptcy of liberalism. Thus, from a theological standpoint, August 1914, in a sense, marked the end of the 19th century Europe. In the 1930s, the process was virtually repeated. In desperate economic straits, Germany saw the hope of salvation in Adolf Hitler's National Socialist Party. A major segment of the state church endorsed that movement. Indeed, they did. Seeing it as God's way of working in history, Bart spoke out against the Nazi government and as a result was forced to leave his teaching post in Germany. In each case, later political developments proved that Bart's apprehensions about the theological conclusions of liberalism were well founded. It is important for us to note Bart's understanding of revelation. For Bart, revelation is redemptive in nature. To know God, to have a correct information about him, is to be related to him in salvific experience. Disagreeing with many other theologians, he comments that it is not possible to draw from Romans 1, 18 to 32 any statement regarding natural union with God or knowledge of God on the part of man in himself as such. And Carl is just wrong. It's just bald, dogmatic, Germanic, Teutonic, imperialistic imposition of a rude dimension. If he's going to accept Romans 1 to 18 to 32, he obviously does not. In his debate with Emil Brunner, Bart said, how can Brunner maintain that a real knowledge of the true God, however imperfect it may be, does not bring salvation? Well, that's kind of the whole idea of the section there, uh, Carly. Uh, he's, sorry, Carl. Uh, Bart is very skeptical of the view that man is able to know God apart from revelation in Christ. This would mean that man can know the existence, the being of God, without knowing anything of the grace and mercy of God. This would injure the unity of God, since it would extract from his being, from the fullness of his activity. If a man could achieve some knowledge of God outside of his revelation, which is in Jesus Christ, man would have contributed at least in some small measure to his salvation. And you see, poor little uh, Eric here and poor little Carl just kind of missing God in all of this because they're such subjectivists. Me, my, and I. I, me, and my. For Bart, revelation always and only the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. The word becomes flesh. Apart from the incarnation, there is no revelation. Behind this position, probably unrecognized for Bart, an existentialist conception of truth as person to person and subjective going back and forth, both to Kierkegaard and Buber. The possibility of knowledge of God outside the gracious revelation in Christ would eliminate the need for Christ. Uh, for revelation. Bart must, however, face the problem of the existence of natural theology. Why has it arisen and persisted? persisted? He recognizes that several biblical passages have been traditionally cited as justification for engaging in natural theology. Psalm, 1, Psalm 19 and Romans 1. What is to be done with them? <laughs> I would exegete him, boys. 
He states that the main line of scripture teaches that what unites man with God is from God's side is grace. How can there be some other way by which man can approach God? Another way of knowing him. There are three possible ways of handling the apparent description discrepancy between this main line and this side line of scripture. Number one, re-examine the main line to see whether it can be interpreted in such a way to allow for the side line. Two, consider both valid but contradictory. This is weary, wearisome stuff. Three, interpret the sideline, a few passages, there's more than a few that talk about natural revelation. But poor Carly here, he can't quite handle that. We're dealing here with Carl. This is volume two. In his book on Romans, they called it the great bombshell in Europe in 1919, the Romer brief. Remember the first time I read a piece of rubbish? It was, it was, it was poor. I've been used to reading some of the great classics and all this hot talk about Karl Barth and Romans. And I picked it up and read it and I go, where's the beef? <laughs> Overrated in a context looking for some certainty after the dem demise of theology with the Libos. Anyways, the first possibility has already been eliminated. What about maintaining that there simply are two contradictory notes here producing a paradox? Contrary to what many people had expected, Bart rejected that alternative. Since the biblical witness is God's revelation and a human idea, contradictions cannot be present. This leaves only the third possibility, interpreting the sideline so as not to contradict the main line. In interpreting Psalm 19, Bart understands verse 3. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard as adversative to 1 and 2. Thus, the psalmist denies in verse 3 what he seems to be affirming in verses 1 and 2. Nice try, Carl. Spend some more time in languages. Bart also maintains that the first six verses of Psalm might be understood in the light of 7 to 14. Thus the witness which man sees in the cosmos does not come about independently, but in utter coordination with and subordination to the witness of God speaking and acting in the people and among the people of Israel. Carl Bart must admit that Romans 1, 18 to 32 definitely states that man has knowledge of God. Bart denies, however, that this knowledge of God is independent of the divine revelation of the gospel. Rather, he maintains that the people Paul had in view have already been presented with the revelation of God declared. And in the same context, he says that he's eager to preach the gospel. Essentially, then, Bart's interpretations of both passages is the same. The persons in view do find God in the cosmos, but they do so because they have already know God from a special revelation. Therefore, what has happened is that they have read into or projected upon the created order what they know from this revelation. It is true that in later portions of his church dogmatics, Bart seemed to modify his position somewhat. Here he granted that although Jesus Christ is the one true light and life, light of life, the creation contains numerous lesser lights that display his glory. Bart, however, does not speak of any of these as rev revelation, reserving that designation for the word. 
he retains the term lights. It is notable that in his later summary statement, Evangelical Theology, Bart made no mention of a revelation through the creative order. Is the guy blind? Dead? How can you not look up at the sky and see without all the long talk who God is? And that's Paul's argument in Romans 118 without all this long talking page after page. <laughs> Thus it seems to have made little or no real practical import upon his theology. Yeah, he's too busy running around with his, his mistress. Yeah, he had a years long adulterous relationship as a theologian. It's offensive. He's offensive. Bart's offensive against natural theology is understandable, especially given his experience with it in Germany. Exegesis by political events? That's what dispensationalists do. Come on now, Millard. As we shall note in the next section, Bart engaged in some rather questionable exegesis. You think? Apparently his interpretations followed necessarily from his presuppositions, as they always do. God's revelation is exclusively in Jesus Christ. Yeah, Jesus Christ is co-equal with the Father and the Spirit. Is also the author of natural revelation. Come on, Carl. Oh, I'm glad I didn't have to do doctoral studies under him. Or even at Princeton and systematics back in the 50s and 60s. Because if he didn't toe the line, he got the hammer on the head. Liberals were not ooh, nice people. They didn't take over the main line. Oh, they had smooth speech. But there was no room for the machins and the warfields. My God, he preserved that lineage. The general revelation has always responded to positively rather than ignored or rejected. That's false too there, old Carly. That revelation is always redemptive or salvific in nature. The guy obviously doesn't get it. Bart brought these assumptions to his interpretation of the biblical passages which seem to speak of general revelation. These assumptions lead to an overall conception, conceptual scheme which has difficulty accounting for the data brings to us to the conclusion that one or more of them are inappropriate or invalid. Examination of the relevant passages. We now need to examine more closely several key passages dealing with the issue of general revelation to see what they say. We will draw the meanings of these several passages together into a coherent position on the subject. Let's see here. He's going to do that, and then he's going to general revelation without natural theology. On a, of the many nature psalms, all conveying the same basic meaning. Psalm 19 is perhaps the most explicit. The language used is very vivid. The verb translated, are telling, is misafarim. Misafarim. It's a pretty small print there. This is a PL participle form of safer a book. In the cal or simple stem, the verb means to count or reckon or number. In the pl, it means to recount or relate. And as you can see why the idea of book gets connected with this. The use of the participle suggests an ongoing process. The verb midvar or magid from Nagad means to declare or to show. The verb Yaibiyad, hifil imperfect of Nava, means to pour forth or emit, cause to bubble or belch forth. It especially conveys the idea of free flowing, spontaneous emission. <coughs> the verb Yahweh from Hawa 
and simply to declare to El Magnum. On the surface, these verses asserted, assert that created nature tells forth the glory of God. The real interpretive question here involves the status of verse 3, which literally says there is no speech, there are no words where their voice is not heard. Five major interpretations as to how this verse relates to the preceding verse have been offered, and he refers here to Franz Delich. Number one, verse three is saying that there are no words, that the witnesses are silent, speechless witnesses. They are inaudible, but everywhere intelligible. That's its prima facie reading, perspicuous reading. If this were the case, however, verse 3 would have the effect of interrupting the flow of the hymn, and the following verse ought to begin with a vav adversative. <laughs> Says the Baptist professor of Minnesota on what should or shouldn't have been an above adversative. What a, what a, at least we can laugh a little bit for crying out loud. Verse 3 should be taken as a second view, as a circumstantial clause modifying the following verse. This is the interpretation of George Ewald. The verses would then be rendered without loud speech. Their sound has resounded all the earth. There are both lexical and syntactical problems with the interpretation. Omer does not sound for loud speech and cut. Kawam does not mean their sound. Also, verse 3 contains nothing to betray any design subordination to the next verse. Verse 3 should be made independent and adversative. Thus, it effectively denies what the first two verses affirm. This is Bart's position. Yet, what wonders what it, in what context suggests such an antithesis? In addition, one would expect the verb yatsai of verse 4 to appear already in verse 3. Furthermore, while some other interpretations of the verse require the supplying of one element of speech, Bart's interpretation would require both the vav consecutive and the preposition with. The law of Occam's razor would suggest looking for and then adopting a simpler treatment, which will yet adequately explain the verse. Number four, the ver interpretation of Luther, Calvin, and others is that verse three should be rendered. There is no language, and there are no words in which this message is not heard. Now, that's basically going back to the first view. This would emphasize the universality of the language coming to every nation and language group. In that case, however, we would expect to find Ain Lachon or Ain Safa. Huh? <laughs> That's it, Millie? Oh, this is dreary. I'm sorry to be bringing this stuff to you, but we got a soldier through it, muscle our way through it. Look out the window, look up at the sky. It's blue, it's big, God's big, God is. He's talking right now, as I sit here, not with French, German, Italian, Greek, Hebrew, Latin. He's just talking. Common people get the idea. Moving on to the fifth interpretation of Psalm 19, the rendering followed by the Septuagint, Campegius, Vintraga, and Ferdinand Hitzig. There's no language and there are no, no there are no words whose voice is unheard and inaudible. Well, it's the same as point one and point four of Calvin and Luther. Now we're going to get the rendering of the great exegete. The last interpretation appears most desirable for several reasons. In the form, there is no speech. There are no words inaudible. There is no need to supply missing words. Much depends here upon the translation of the negative particle. 
This particle is used chiefly to negate an adjective or participle, thus functioning as does the prefixed alpha in Greek, alpha in English. An example of this usage, Belim Mashiach, in 2 Samuel 121, which the RSV translates, not anointed with oil. Such a rendering of Psalm 19.3 is perfectly natural, not requiring insertion of any missing words. There remains the question of the relationship of verses 17 to 2014 and the first six verses of the psalm. Bart suggests that the first part be interpreted in the light of the latter part. In general, interpreting a verse in the light of its context is a sound exegetical principle. In this case, however, suggesting, as Bart does, that the person who find this written in nature do so because they know the law of God seems artificial. There's no indication of such length or transition. Consequently, what we have in the latter part of the psalm is an ascension to another topic, showing how the law goes beyond the revelation in the cosmos. And I think we will just uh, call that here. Glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.